Hey, all you weird, beautiful homo sapiens. I'm Julie. And I'm Corey. And welcome back to the Unfiltered Sense Podcast, episode four. Episode four. Today, we have a very sad case. It's very hard to hear some of the details. So we're going to give a trigger warning right now. It, in- it does involve children, kidnapping, human trafficking, rape, abuse, and torture. So we are going to be covering the case of Peter Scully, who would sexually abuse and torture children, film it, and post it on the dark web. Yes. Yeah, so if this triggers you, we totally understand. We'll catch you next time yes, in our sure. next episode. Just a couple of reminders. This episode is available to watch on YouTube. Yes. If you would rather watch instead of just listen and see our beautiful faces. Oh, <laughs> I don't know if they want to see that. Oh, yes. Then but if that, you want to see the stuff yeah. we put on the screen while we tell the story, then you can watch it. So if you do want to watch this episode, check the link in our show notes to our YouTube channel and please subscribe while you're there. Yes. Also, if you want to just skip right ahead and get into the story, check the ti- the timestamps in our show notes. Also, if you're new to this podcast, we always go over our events of the week before we get into the story. So if you don't feel like hearing us bitch for a minute, feel free to go right into the story <laughs> if you want to. Yeah. So with that being said, should we get into our events of the week? Events of the week. Are you going to go first this week? Yes. I'm going to go first. Take it away. Okay, so my little bitching moment of the week is whenever it's really manners. Okay, I want to touch on manners. I feel like everyone needs a lesson on manners. Okay. Okay, so whenever you are in a drive through in a store, wherever you may be, whenever you say thank you when you grab an object from someone mm-hmm. and they do not respond to you, that infuriates me. I know. I'm like, if there's anything that I want to teach our kid, it's to respond when someone says something to you. Yeah. If I say thank that you, that person is there. Yeah. Like, if I say thank you for grabbing a bag, then that person needs to say you're welcome because yep. that's customer service. And that's where they're they're working in customer service. I can't tell you how many windows I've sat at and waited on them to say something because they wouldn't say anything. AKA where? McDonald's mainly. <laughs> McDonald's. God, every time I go through McDonald's, it's like they, they hand can't me the bag speak. and I say thank you, and they literally they won't even look at me. Yeah, and I'll I'll fucking sit there until they say, "Do you need something else?" I'll be like, "I just need a fucking you're welcome." Yeah, <laughs> that shit drives me crazy. I know. So that was like short and sweet, but I just feel like everyone, I feel like it's not that hard to be kind to another human, and to me, mm-hmm. that is responding whenever they say something as small as thank you. I agree. Okay, so my event of the week is going to be short also. Mm-hmm. It's just, it's more of a pet peeve that I have. Mm-hmm. Um, I can't stand when an uneducated person tries to give somebody feedback or criticism on something. Mm-hmm. Nothing will send me over the edge faster than that. And that is like my biggest life pet peeve. Yeah. I will never, if I don't know all the detail, if I'm not extremely educated on a certain subject or topic, I will not be the person that's going to come in and be like, you're doing it wrong. Yeah. Like you're not going to fucking add your two cents if you don't have the two cents to add. Yeah. Mm, I agree. I agree. I deal with it the most in music when people will comment. And that's the thing. Like I know they're just trolls or haters, but some people I really don't think they're trying to come across as a troll. They're really, they really think that what they're saying is true. Yeah. Like it's irrelevant. And But you can tell in their statement. Mm-hmm. that they know nothing about what they're saying. There are some people in this world that just have to be right and they have to have the final say about everything. Yeah. So it's not even really trolls. It's yeah. these people really think that what they're saying is true and they clearly have no idea what they're even talking about. Yeah. Like they will back that shit 100%. I just hate it so much because there's a lot of people who might not be able to, or like if there's somebody new at something, they might not know if that person doesn't know that the what they're talking about. They might think that what they're saying is true and that might affect them in a negative way if they are not able to pick up on the fact that they clearly don't know what they're saying. Yeah. Those kinds of people, like, just keep your fucking mouth shut. Yeah. Go read a goddamn book and do a little Google search on whatever you think it is that you're trying to inform someone on and make sure that you have your facts right. Yeah, because I know if I'm going to come at someone, I'm going to be 100% correct. Me too. (laughs) So, yeah, like, go educate yourself before you comment On something that you know nothing about. Yeah. On anything anybody is doing. Okay. That's it. So we got through those pretty quick. I know. So should we get into the story today? We should. All right. So the sources for this story are listed in the show notes. 
And just one more trigger warning in case you missed the first one. This one does involve children, kidnapping, human trafficking, rape, abuse, and torture. So if that's anything that you guys don't want to listen to or it might be triggering for you, we completely understand if you want to skip this episode. Mm -hmm. And we just want to add that we want to bring awareness to these cases. This is not something that we enjoy talking about, obviously, but the whole point in this to us is to bring awareness to these cases. We're not trying to glorify any of these evil people. In any kind of way, we mean absolutely no disrespect to any of the families of any of the victims we ever talk about. Um, We simply just want to bring awareness to other people because I am very thankful for certain podcasts in true crime that have opened my eyes to a lot of things. And it has made me a very cautious person, not only for myself, but for my kid. Mm -hmm. Because it's seriously, it's everywhere. Anything can happen. And I feel like whenever people, if people are more aware of some of the signs, Mm -hmm. it could possibly save your life. Mm-hmm. And so that is what's important to us whenever we tell these stories. Yeah. And you can also literally solve a case by speaking of a certain topic. I mean, I mm-hmm. know like I've watched podcasts and they help solve a case. Yeah. I mean, obviously that's where we want this to go. We want it to grow to a place where we can help in that way too. But until we get there, we just want to remind people that we're only trying to bring awareness. We're not, we don't enjoy necessarily enjoy what we're saying and what we're talking about it's really to just educate people on just how dangerous and evil the world is because i feel like a lot of it is hidden from society about just how evil some people are yes so just be aware of your surroundings all the time all right so this case has a lot to do with the dark web so first i want to talk a little bit about exactly what the dark web is for those who might not know There are actually three levels of the internet. The first level is what is called the surface web, which is the internet that we all use on a daily basis, like Google, social media, Amazon, YouTube, those types of sites. All of that is done on what's known as the surface web. There are billions and billions of different unique web pages on the surface web. You could literally sit there and try to click through every single one, and you would never get through even like a quarter of all the websites out there in your lifetime. That's That's how much takes up on the surface web. The surface web is actually only about 5% of the entire internet. There's so much more internet underneath the surface web that a lot of people aren't aware of. I mean, I'm not aware of all that. (laughs) I feel like you have to be into that kind of thing to even know. There's Mm -hmm. a lot of people that don't know that there's anything beyond the surface web. Yeah, and the thing about the dark web is... It's not like the typical, it's not like the internet we use. Mm -hmm. Like, It's not like as easy as typing in a website. Mm -hmm. You really have to know some type of like coding Mm -hmm. And just there's different, you have to have certain programs um, in order to navigate it. So it's not, you really have to know what you're doing. You really have to want to be there. Yeah. So the remaining 95% of the web is mainly deep web, which there is a difference between the deep and the dark web. The deep web is really used for like governments and police, like the FBI. It's kind of a place for like the FBI to communicate with each other, Mm -hmm. store sensitive information, also for like medical records. And it's really just used to store information that wouldn't be safe on the surface web. Yeah, more confidential. Yeah, so that's where kind of like all this stuff takes place is the deep web. And the last 5 to 10% of the World Wide Web is actually the dark web. And it is definitely a scary place that nobody wants to go to. There's so much illegal activity that goes on on the dark web. You can buy guns, you can buy drugs. Um, there's actually even stories of people selling their organs for money. You can hire hitmen to kill your husband or whoever it is you want dead. Um, It's just a very scary place that you do not want to be. And it can be very dangerous if you accidentally somehow get there. Yeah. It can be very dangerous. Yeah. These people will come after you if they can figure out who you are. I know. Should you like touch on that one time where you accidentally? Yeah, so (laughs) I'm not exactly sure how this happened. I know I was trying to, this was before we were doing our podcast. This was years ago. Mm Mm-hmm. I've always really been into true crime, though. So I think I was trying to find, like, information on a specific case that I was, like, reading about. And I know I'm pretty sure I was on Reddit, which Reddit in a, Reddit is on the surface web, but it's actually, it can be very dark there. Really? There are certain forums on Reddit that it's pretty easy to fall into on accident, and mm-hmm. you will regret it because there can there will be things on there that you don't ever want to see. And that's kind of what happened to me. I wasn't seeking out anything like this, but I stumbled upon a video that ended up being a snuff film. And for people who don't know what a snuff film is, it's whenever somebody is murdered on camera or it can it, they can even be live streamed. 
mm. somebody killing someone on a live stream. But I accidentally stumbled upon this video of a man in Mexico who was alive and having his head cut off by Mexican cartel. Yeah, you've had many nightmares since then about that. That traumatized me. I won't go to Mexico. Mm -hmm. I will never go to Mexico. I just won't. For that reason. Yeah, Yeah, because... Because once I saw this video, it's not like I didn't complete the video. I could not, I couldn't finish it. Mm-hmm. Well, because you realized what it was and you were like, oh my God. Yeah. Well, it was, it was a very poor quality. I really couldn't tell for a while what was happening. Mm-hmm. Anyway, so I, I, I was stuck on it for a minute because I couldn't tell. I didn't know if it was something to do with that case that I was looking stuff up for. It traumatized me. I had nightmares about it. And the scariest part about it was, was that the next morning after watching this video, I was I woke up and I was in some kind of group chat on my phone and there was maybe 15 different contacts in there. Like there was 15 different phone numbers, including mine, but the whole group text was directed at me. They were saying my name. They knew my name and they attached a picture of a chicken that had its head cut off. And I can't remember exactly what the messages were saying, but they were directed at me. They knew my name. Mm -hmm. They knew somehow that I had seen that video because the reference of the chicken with its head cut off told me that. And I was freaking Freaking out. out. I thought these people were knew where I lived. Yeah. They were coming to get me, coming to kill me. (laughs) I did not know what had happened. I don't know. Yeah, it was bad. Like I was saying, it can be a very dangerous place. I don't know how that video is able to be up on the surface web because there's so many more like it. There's so much that happens. And that kind of goes back to why we're telling stories like this. There's so much that happens every single day that people aren't aware of that Mm -hmm. is so scary and it's so normal, especially like in other countries and like third world countries and stuff like that. It's so normal there Mm -hmm. to just literally be beheaded in the street and people walking by don't think anything of it. Yeah. Like it's terrifying. But anyway, back to this story. Another big part of the dark web is actually illegal porn and much of that being like child porn. And it's also where a lot of pedophiles kind of congregate and come together and they make friends with each other. They share stories, they share pictures and videos, and they just do all this disgusting stuff together because it's the only place where they're able to do that and have some sense of community. Yeah. That's so fucking sick. So the big thing about the dark web is it is very hard, if not nearly impossible to trace anyone there. Everybody is able to mask any identifying factors about them. They can hide their IP addresses and it's not like a VPN Like a VPN, we can download on our phones right now and we can set it to make it look like we're in a different state or a different country Yeah, and it can hide our IP address and stuff like that. But it can still be tracked back to you Mm -hmm. if an investigation was done. But the thing about the dark web is it's not, it's so much more advanced than that. There's literally no way because it runs off of all these different servers and like, it's just, you can't track anybody there. And really the only way that people ever get caught doing anything illegal is if undercover agents basically become friends with somebody or like build trust with people that they're after. Mm -hmm. And somehow those people end up giving the undercover agents some kind of information that allows them to find these people. That's really the only way people are ever caught. And Unlike the surface web, the dark web isn't run or controlled by the government in any kind of way. So these websites, it's very hard to get these websites shut down where all this illegal stuff is happening. So that's just a little bit of information about the dark web. I'm not extremely educated on it. That's just the information that I do know Mm -hmm. and a little bit of what I did find because this story does have a lot to do with the dark web. So I wanted to let people know exactly what that was in case they didn't know. And how fucking scary it is. and. Pretty much don't access it. Don't even try. Yeah. (laughs) It's not worth it. So this story starts between 2012 and 2014. A video began going around on the surface web that clearly did not belong on the surface web. It was a four-part film. The film is called Daisy's Destruction. People were talking and they were saying that they had heard about this terrifying video that was going around called Daisy's Destruction. But a lot of these people had not seen the video themselves. A lot of people did not know if the video actually did exist and so it kind of became an urban legend. It was just something a lot of people talked about but a lot of people actually have not seen for themselves. And it also wasn't up long. Yeah. Once it started getting reported it was taken down pretty quick so... There wasn't a lot of opportunity for a lot of people to even watch it. Yeah, but the fact that that did get out. Yeah. Unfortunately, this video was real. 
It was created on the dark web and it somehow got leaked onto the surface web, like chat groups, forums, and pages and stuff like that. We're going to kind of talk about what was going on in these videos without really getting into a lot of details because the details are just too much. It's heartbreaking. Yeah. So we'll just kind of outline what these videos consisted of. Yes. It was a four-part film with three adults in it, two women and one man who were all torturing and raping three children. The children were ages 12, 11, and the youngest one of the three, who was also Daisy herself, was only 18 months old. So like I said earlier, we're not, I'm not going to go into details of what exactly happened in these videos, and that's partly because we really don't know. Um, a lot of people don't know exactly what happened in these videos, and even if I knew, we wouldn't share it because it's, it does involve children and it's just too gruesome. Online, there's really just a lot of rumors about exactly what was going on in the videos because not a lot of people know exactly what happened. And then even people that do know exactly what happened, they're not going to come out and say, because then that would show that they were seeking out these videos and seeking out to watch child porn. Yeah. So they're not going to admit that they were looking for this video. The police, on the other hand, obviously know everything that happened in these videos. And that just makes me feel really bad that they had to sit there and watch every second, frame by frame, of everything that was going on. That is literally torture. I really hope that they all got some kind of help after this, some mm -hmm. kind of therapy, because I can I cannot imagine. You have no choice but to watch it. Yeah, you're forced to watch it because you have to find the sick fucker that did it. Yeah. People online who have seen snuff films like police that have seen really horrible, disgusting things have said that these videos are the most disgusting thing that they have ever watched. So like I said earlier, in these videos, there were two women and a man, and throughout the four parts of this film, the women were masked, so you really couldn't see their faces. And the man's face was like blurred out on every single shot that he was in. It was like pixelated, so you couldn't see who he was. But he also wasn't in a whole lot of the scenes. It, was, it seemed like maybe he was more behind the camera, operating mm -hmm. the camera, kind of like directing what was going on. But there were a few times where he would show and in, come into frame and partake in the torture. The video starts out, of course, with part one, and it's already so disgusting and twisted, and that only progressed further as you got into the final parts, with the fourth part being the absolute worst one of them all. The videos did involve a lot of sexual abuse, but also just a lot of physical torture and physical abuse. It was just these three adults causing so much pain to these children and filming the whole thing. This is actually like a whole genre on the dark web. It's actually called hurtcore. So it's like hardcore, but hurtcore. And it's where adults inflict pain on children just for viewing pleasure. And sometimes in these hurt core videos, they would have other children inflict pain on each other. And for whatever reason, this is what a lot of people want to see. This is their fetish. And this is what uh, a lot of people want to see. I just can't fucking even imagine. It's so disgusting. It's so terrifying. Daisy's destruction found its way onto the biggest hurt core website on the dark web. And this website was called hurt to the core. Daisy's destruction actually became pretty viral on this website, although not everyone on the site saw it because you actually had to pay in order to watch it. And it was being sold for $10,000 oh in order to be God. able to watch this four-part film. $10,000 and people were buying it. Even if it was $20, like who would pay to watch that? There's people out there that would pay, that did pay. Obviously so desperate to see that, that they would pay $10,000. Sick. This video was so bad, though, that even other pedophiles in the community on the dark web were talking about the video and pretty much denouncing it, saying that they were all just very sick and twisted. So that tells you right there yeah. how fucking bad it was. If other pedophiles are like, that's fucked up. Yeah. So real quick, we're just going to kind of talk about this hurtcore community a little bit. And I'm positive that all these sites are still going on because unfortunately, there's no way to really stop these sites from happening and to stop these people from existing. But as far as whenever this case took place, a lot of the really notorious people in this community have been locked up. So one of the most notorious members of this sick community was actually someone who worked in childcare. During the day, he would work with kids and then he would go home and watch these videos of children being hurt and abused and sexually abused. Mm. It's enough, I feel like, to watch abuse, but then like sexual abuse is a whole different level. Yeah. And he works with fucking children all day. Yeah. Within the whole Hurtcore community, everyone pretty much knew everyone because it's not a very large community. It's not like typical pedophilia. Not many people are into this level of twistedness. Obviously, these people didn't know each other in real life or even know their real names. They only knew each other by their usernames. 
They knew who each person was as far as who they were on the website, and they would create these sick friendships with one another and would share things with each other. People would give shout outs to each other in the videos. One guy actually wrote another's username on a piece of paper, and in the video, he got the child to hold up the piece of paper to give that person a shout out. Oh my God. That is just heartbreaking. I mean, basically, this was like their social media community. Mm -hmm. It was a place where they could all go and make friends and talk about their interests and things that they could not talk about with just anyone, but with all of this other horrific stuff going on at the same time. Disgusting. That just shows you how truly fucked up these kinds of people are. The fact they can combine the two things of like making friends and sharing stories with this whole fucking hurtcore pornography side of it. That's fucking disgusting. Okay, so back to the actual case that we're talking about today. Like I said earlier, the Daisy's Destruction film got leaked onto the regular web, and so this was picked up by police pretty much immediately. The case was originally picked up by the Dutch police, but because of the severity of the case and because of the fact that it was online on the dark web, and because everyone's faces were covered in the videos, they literally could have been coming from anywhere. So because of this, having only the Dutch police investigating this really didn't make a lot of sense. The case was pretty much spread worldwide and kind of like everybody became involved in this investigation all over the world. Police started to theorize that the three children in the videos were from the Philippines and that they were what is known as street children. And I really hate that like that's what they're called, but yeah. this is why they're called that. Street children were basically orphans. And apparently in the Philippines, whenever parents don't want their kids anymore or something happens to their parents, they will literally just leave them on the side of the street. That's so fucked up. So they became known as street children. So this narrowed down the search, at least to the Philippines, mostly because the likelihood is that these three children were found by these three adults in the Philippines. And it was believed that the three adults were already in the Philippines because it didn't make a lot of sense if they found them there to then take them out of the Philippines. So the likelihood was that the video was created there also. Mm -hmm. Because it was probably a bigger risk of getting caught. Yeah, to try to get them out and all that. Mm -hmm. So now police have to try and figure out or at least try to narrow down who these three adults may have been. The two women were very noticeably more tan than the man was. The man was very pale. In the videos, the man was actually speaking English, and the females would speak English back to him, but their English was kind of broken, and it wasn't very good. So that was another thing that told the police that at least the women were probably not originally from an English-speaking country, but that the man was because his English was pretty perfect. The case was pushed more kind of to English-speaking countries like Australia, America, England, everywhere like that. And they were asking them, does anyone recognize the accent that he has? And the Australian police came forward and said, yep, that is an Australian accent. So the Australian police started thinking about who this man could possibly be. They were looking at different cases like unsolved cases, missing people, runaways, and they actually found something interesting that they could potentially link to this. So the police in Australia at the time in 2014 were working on a case of a man who had like 70 different charges against him. However, He had completely fled the country before he could be charged with any of them. What a fucking surprise, right? This man's name was Peter Scully. He was in his late 40s, and he had a wife and two children. That is so disturbing. That's what I'm saying. You never know. Just Just an ordinary person. He lived in a nice suburb in Australia, and he had just a very normal life and a normal career. And he was just literally like any other normal family man. He was intelligent, he was wealthy, he was friendly, and he was very popular among his peers and people in that area. But underneath all of that, he was a serial fraudster over the years. He had actually scammed over 2.6 million Australian dollars from different investors with this fake-like property investment scheme that he was running. Mm -hmm. It was later revealed, way after this case, that he was also at the time running an illegal escort service with a woman. She was a young Malaysian woman that actually turned out to be his mistress. So Peter seemed like this perfect family man by day. And then at night, he was this notorious criminal, someone that was unfaithful to his wife and who hired his girlfriend as a sex worker. You never know. You never know, people. So around 2011, before the Daisy's Destruction video was made, police found out that all of this was going on with Peter Scully. And so then he was a wanted man. But as most of us know, normally, when it's something this serious, police kind of keep that to themselves. And they don't say much because obviously he was a flight risk. 
And that is exactly what he did when he found out that he was a wanted man. He fled the country. So first, the police thought maybe he had gone to Malaysia with his girlfriend. However, searching all of Malaysia really wasn't an option. The police really had no idea what to do. They didn't really even know where to start. And then, around two years later, when this video pops up of a white Australian man with two young Asian women, police feared that this might be Peter, and that maybe this was another one of his schemes or escort services, or whatever the hell it was that he was doing before. So police began making more and more connections between the two cases, and they quickly realized that they were on the right path and that they had the right man. So the police start looking for Peter Scully in the Philippines, and they had very few leads, but they investigated every lead that would come in, and eventually this led them to one particular city in the Philippines, Mele Bele City. It took the police two years to track him down. The video Daisy's destruction was made in 2012, and they eventually found him in that city in the Philippines in 2015. So that was three whole years that he could have been continuing on his sick journey and doing God knows what. We're going to talk about what Peter was doing in those three years before he was caught, but before we do, I just want to kind of wrap up the Daisy's Destruction video. So the police did eventually find two of the three children that were in the video. They found the oldest child, who was 12 years old at the time of the video, and they also found Daisy, who was the 18-month-old baby in the video. Daisy was alive, and she was a toddler at this point, but she had sustained such horrible injuries during the videos that she will have forever lasting physical damage on her body. And I couldn't find exactly what those injuries were, but she will never fully be healthy for the rest of her life. That's heartbreaking. Very. The 11-year-old girl that was featured in the videos wasn't with the other two children, and when I was researching the case, I could not find out exactly what happened to her. There were some sources that would say some things, and then others would say that she was never found. So I'm just going to tell you what some of the sources said, but remember that some of the sources also say she was never found, so I'm not really sure how much truth there is to this part. But supposedly Peter Scully strangled this girl to death whenever she could no longer withstand the torture and the abuse that he was inflicting on her, and he buried her under the floorboards of his home. Again, I don't know how true that is. Whenever I was researching, I did see pictures of what looked like a floor that had been dug up, but mm -hmm. nothing on the picture said exactly what it was a picture of, and I couldn't, think, I couldn't find anything specifically that said. Yeah. that this is what happened. But this is what one of the sources said, so I don't know how much truth there is to that, but that's just one possibility. The three girls that were featured in Daisy's destruction were not Peter Scully's only victims. He actually had two more after that. Peter Scully actually had two girlfriends in the Philippines, and these women were later confirmed to have been the two masked women in the videos. The girlfriends were 18-year-old Carme Ann Alvarez and 19-year-old Lizelle Margallo. Both of these women grew up as street kids themselves in the Philippines, and they were actually taken from the side of the road by Peter Scully himself whenever they were just children. Peter raised them in a very weird way. He was obviously grooming them, but he also brought them up like half his children, but also like his girlfriends. That's very confusing. It's very strange. He would also sell the girls to other men for periods of time, so he would sell them as like sex workers. Mm -hmm. And they were also Peter's own sex slaves whenever they were at home. They never really had a break from any of the sexual abuse ever since they were children. And because they were just children and they were street children whenever they were taken by Peter, they never had an example of what a healthy relationship looks like. And so he would call them his girlfriends. He would tell them that their relationship was special. And so because they didn't have anything to compare this to, they really grew up thinking and understanding that this way of living was the right way. And this relationship was normal. They would even tell people later on that they felt safe their because, whole life yeah, because they, they didn't know any other way. They had no idea. So now after the Daisy's Destruction video was made around 2014 or at the beginning of 2015, Peter Scully turned to his girlfriend Alvarez and he told her that he wanted to adopt some children. He said he really wanted to help some children out that might need it and he was thinking about just getting some street children off the street the same way he did with them. At first she kind of tried to talk him out of this and she even said why don't we just get my sister to come live with us and you can take care of her instead of bringing in street children that we don't really know. But Peter insisted that they needed to get street children. He wanted to bring up these children the same way that he had done with her. So he brought this idea up to Alvarez and his other girlfriend, and he said that it was kind of like an opportunity to change a child's life. He was going to bring them in, and he was going to raise them and give them all these opportunities in life, whenever really the only reason why he wanted a street child was because they had no family to notice whenever they went missing. Peter knew exactly what his intentions were. He wanted a child that he was either going to kidnap or try to groom, or a kid that he could kill, and he knew that he couldn't do that if it was Alvarez's sister. So Peter gave his girlfriend Alvarez very specific instructions. He told her to go out onto the street and do not come back until she found two young girls, specifically aged 9 and 12. That's sick that he has that fetish mm -hmm. for that age. 
It didn't take long before she came across two girls. They were actually two cousins. They were the exact same ages that Peter wanted, and they were very poor street children. She led them back to the house on the pretense that they could have food and they could stay over and have breakfast the next morning. Alvarez took the girls back to the house and she just dropped them off with Peter and she left. As soon as they were there, they were given food just like she promised and everything seemed great. However, after they finished eating, Peter Scully told both of these girls to strip down naked and that is when he took pictures of them and he posted them on the dark web. He also took a video of the girls and he directed them to do certain things to each other, which is just absolutely disgusting. So disgusting. That's so sad. And for him to post that on the dark web, I mean... Yeah, evil. After this, he began abusing both of the girls. And they, of course, began to scream, cry, and to stop them from making noise, one of his girlfriends went and got a pillow and she would smother them until they almost died. The next morning, when the girls woke up, Scully gave them more food for breakfast, and then when they finished, he told them to go out back and to begin digging. As these girls were out there digging, Peter came out to the garden, and he told them that they were digging their own graves, and that soon he was going to kill them, and they were going to be laid to rest right where they were digging. So after five days of joining in on this abuse and torture of these poor little girls, Peter's girlfriend, Alvarez, suddenly began to feel remorseful whenever she saw that Peter had put dog collars on them. Wow. That's when she began to feel remorseful? Yeah. Okay. Not all the other shit. Like a dog collar? She felt so bad at this point that she unchained the girls and she let them go. Good. These two girls were brave enough to go to the police and tell them what had exactly just happened. And this is when they finally tracked down and arrested Peter Scully in 2015. The police arrested Peter on suspicion of 75 different charges that included murder, rape, fraud, kidnapping, and human trafficking. Of course, the police also seized all of his electronics, his computers, his phones, everything to see exactly what Peter Scully had been doing all of these years. But they didn't get very far with this because suspiciously enough, the room where all of these electronics were held at the police department was set on fire. And it was just that one room. And unfortunately, everything in there was burned beyond recovery. There was literally nothing that the police could do at that point. And people believe that Peter had probably bribed a police officer to set that room on fire because who knows what the police would have found on those electronics. And apparently the police in the Philippines were pretty known for being kind of corrupt. So it's not completely out of the realm of possibility that this is the case because Peter was very wealthy. He did have a lot of money, so it wouldn't have probably taken much to persuade a police officer to do this for him. So now the police had absolutely no evidence to say that Peter Scully had any part of the Daisy's Destruction video or any of these other forums or videos. They couldn't prove anything. The only thing that they were able to prove was that Peter Scully had kidnapped, abused, and tortured these other two little girls for five days, and so that was all he ended up being charged with. He was charged with one count of human trafficking and five counts of rape. He was later found guilty in 2018, but if he would have been found guilty one year earlier, then he would have been eligible for the death penalty. However, in the Philippines in 2017, they passed a law that said rape was no longer grounds for capital punishment. Why? Tell me why. (laughs) So instead, Peter Scully was just given a life sentence, and he is now serving that back over in Australia. So something a little interesting, and this is also a rumor, so I'm not really sure this is true, but it is rumored that Peter Scully is actually writing a book, like an autobiography in jail. I feel like he shouldn't even get the privilege to do that. Yeah. So not only does he think that people are that interested in his life story, but if somehow this is a true, if this is true and they, I hope nobody publishes it. Yeah. Because he doesn't deserve to To have any of the royalties for what he's done. Yeah, like let's not glorify him. But let's not even publish it in the first place, right? Yeah. So yeah, that is the case of Peter Scully. That's sick. Very sick. Very scary. And it happens a lot more than I think people realize. Mm -hmm. And like I've seen so many videos lately on social media about moms just in Walmart and their kids get taken from out of the buggy. That's so terrifying. And like this can happen. Like this is what it can lead to. Absolutely. It's everywhere. It's not just other countries it happens in america Mm -hmm. all the time i think just be aware of your surroundings i think everybody needs to always be hyper aware of every situation they're ever in Mm -hmm. even in your house yeah be very aware in your house because i mean as we saw with the idaho murders Mm -hmm. you can't you're not even safe in your own home where you're supposed to feel safe you at least need to still be aware yeah you can go to bed one night and then 
the next morning, everything could have changed. Yeah. So that is going to do it for us today, guys. I hope you guys enjoyed that story. Not enjoyed it, but I hope you got some information out of it that might, I don't know, open your eyes a little bit as to just how evil and corrupt our world is. Maybe it'll make you make some changes in your life, protect mm-hmm. the ones you love. And we will be back next week with another story. Please don't forget to subscribe on Apple Podcasts and Spotify and subscribe to our YouTube channel. We would also love to hear feedback. Leave us a rating. Let us know what y'all like, what y'all don't like. And we're only trying to improve. Yes. But with that being said, I hope everybody stays safe. And stay weird. Bye. Bye.